service. By reciting our traditional Sunday congregational prayer, the words will be shown on the screen. Please repeat along with me. Let us now pray together. We offer our salutations to the all-loving being who endows all beings with consciousness. We meditate on the Lord, who is the origin of the universe. Lord, thou abidest in all, thou art all, thou assumest all forms. Thou art the origin and goal of all. Thou art the self of all. Thou art existence, knowledge, and bliss. Salutations unto thee. May the world be peaceful. May the wicked become gentle. May all creatures think of mutual welfare. May their minds be occupied with what is spiritual and abiding. May our hearts be immersed in selfless love for the Lord. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Friends, we are fortunate um, to have a very distinguished guest speaker with us this evening. Um, I won't stand too long between you and her message, but by way of giving you some of the background. Uh, she serves as the minister or pastor of the Church Beyond the Walls, which is an outdoor street church meeting every Saturday at 2 p.m. in Burnside Park, downtown Providence. Church Beyond the Walls feeds people both spiritually and physically and celebrated its fifth anniversary this year. She also serves as the pastor of the First Lutheran Church of East Greenwich, Rhode Island, and has served in that capacity for the past 22 years. In addition, she teaches world religions and spirituality at Salve Regina University in Newport, Rhode Island, and where she has taught as the adjunct faculty for the past four years in the Department of Religious and Theological Studies. Along with the team of people from the First Lutheran Church, she founded in 2004 Oceans of Grace, Grace Spiritual Center, also located in East Greenwich, Rhode Island. She has been interested in spirituality as a young child, and in 1981, she graduated from Brown University, magna cum laude, with a Bachelor of Arts in Religious Studies. In 1985, she graduated from Harvard University with a Master of Divinity, with a focus on the New Testament and arts of the ministry. She was ordained in the United Church of Christ in 1986, and in 1991, she was ordained in the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. She had done postgraduate studies in the field of spiritual identity and spiritual dire direction in Boston, and in 1993, she completed a three-year program, Spirituality of Christian Leadership, at Our Lady of Peace Spiritual Center Life in Narragansett, Rhode Island. In 2009, she received her certification from Spiritual Directors International after completing a four-year program in spiritual direction through Sacred Heart University. In 2010, she received her Doctorate of Ministry degree from the Lutheran Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, with a focus on spirituality. And developing Oceans of Grace Spiritual Life Center was her doctoral project. She has been receiving and giving spiritual direction for over 30 years and has led hundreds of spiritual, spirituality retreats around the country for women, men, youth, and mixed groups. She is a member of the Rhode Island Council of Churches Interfaith and is a member of the Spiritual Directors International. She is a member of the each East Greenwich Interfaith Clergy, Clergy and a member of presently the Dean of the Rhode Island Lutheran Clergy. In 2012, she was nominated to be the Bishop of the New England Synod of the ELCA, which is the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the only woman of seven nominees. In 2018, she was nominated once again to be Bishop of the New England Synod of the ELCA. In addition to all of that, she is an avid outdoor enthusiast, living her spirituality through cycling, hiking, traveling, writing, and the arts. She is a Christian, but passionate about studying and honoring the faith traditions and focusing on honoring other faith traditions and focusing on the things which unite people of different faiths. Her vocation is to help others to open themselves to the spiritual dimension of life, to grow in their relationship with God, and to be more compassionate in their relationship with others, including the rest of the cosmos. So as we can see, she is a very well 
studied speaker who has devoted pretty much her entire life to some or many aspects of Christianity. The chosen topic for tonight, universal values in Christianity. Please welcome to the podium, Dr. Uh, Reverend Dr. Linda Forsberg. Thank you so much for your gracious hospitality. It's wonderful to be with you again. Um, I've been here a few times before for the celebration of Universal Brotherhood Day. So it's good to be back. Um, my friend Swami, Yogathmananda, Yoga um, told me he could not be here tonight, but um, uh, we are good friends and colleagues, so um, give him my greetings, and I will um, talk about it, uh, let him know how gracious your hospitality was when I speak with him again. Um, before I speak, I always like to, in my own Christian tradition, um, a book that's very uh, meaningful to me is the Book of Psalms. And it's from the Hebrew Bible, from the Old Testament, and it's actually a book of ancient songs. And uh, so if you could just um, join me as we take a moment. This was a prayer uh, composed by King David. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So um, I like to acknowledge biases from the very beginning. <laughs> I think it's important to do that. And so as a person of the Christian faith, I want to make known to you that I, I probably, or I can definitely say, I do not speak for all Christians. There's quite a spectrum within Christianity, as I'm sure you've heard <laughs> and been exposed to the different ends of the spectrum. And it's like that really, isn't it, with every, every tradition? There's a whole spectrum. Um, and so I think, you know, unfortunately, sometimes the, the end of the spectrum that gets focused on or that gets heard about the most in the news, in the media, right, is the um, sort of the, the, the hateful end of the spectrum or the, or the narrow end of the spectrum or the judgmental end of the spectrum. And, um, and, you know, when I hear that coming from my own faith tradition, that makes me very, you know, deeply sad. But that exists. Um, and as someone who teaches world religions, um, I have seen that, you know, in various faiths. We all have people from one end to the other. And I've, my own theory, for what it's worth, is that it has something to do with um, often with the sacred text of a tradition, which many of our sacred texts are, as we know, right, are very, very old. And, um, and from a culture and a history that, you know, is thousands of years old. So my own Christian tradition comes out of Judaism. And Judaism is 4,000 years old. Middle East, Middle Eastern. And, um, and so, for example, you know, 4,000 years ago in the Middle East, when much of the Hebrew Bible was written, women were property. The Ten Commandments talk about women as part of, you know, a proper property. Um, so, there are people today, Christians, who still um, take those texts literally and interpret it in a literal way. And then there are others who, which I am of the, <laughs> the branch of Christianity, which says, no, 
um, we must um, understand the original historical context of a text, right? And what it was addressed, the situation it was addressing. Um, but today, you know, we need to um, apply it to the situation that we're living in today. And so that is the end of the spectrum. I, I need to acknowledge that I'm quite far <laughs> on that end of the spectrum um, than on that other end of the spectrum. So I often feel that um, I have more in common with people of other faiths, do you know what I'm saying, who are more on that end of the spectrum than people within my own faith tradition who in our Christian tradition, we say we call it sort of like fundamentalist Christians, okay? And that's unfortunately who's in the news a lot, condemning others and judging others, and it, it makes me deeply sad. So I had to acknowledge from the beginning that um, that I find that challenging myself, you know. And sometimes I will get in conversations with people on that end of the spectrum and try to share a different perspective, but it can be challenging. And perhaps, you know, you have your challenges too in your own tradition. But I wanted to just acknowledge, so the, the view of Christianity you'll be getting today from me is quite on one end of the spectrum, but I need to acknowledge my own biases. So I very much like the quote that's right here on the front of the podium, right? That truth is one, but we have many names for it. And that is very much what I feel, OK? And so today, we're going to focus on several different principles um, that are within my own Christian tradition, but that I do feel are universal, OK? And the first one um, is that we, there is a creator behind all creation. Um, and so that all creation, this whole earth, everything in it, reflects the divine, right? Reflects the creator, reflects what, what I call God. And that God lives in everything. And so there is a sacredness, right? All is holy. All is sacred. All is to be treated with reverence and respect. Um, I, I love Native American religion where they speak of the web of life and that all life is connected. So what you do to one part of the web, if you harm one part of the web, you harm the whole, you harm all, right? And um, so that is one of, I think, the basic um, values of Christianity is that uh, because we believe that there is a God who created all things, um, that we are to treat all creation right as reflecting God's presence to us, and so to honor it and treat it with reverence and respect. And this has tremendous implications, for example, for the environment. Right, I'm a big environmentalist. Um, now. On the other end of the Christian spectrum, very different, very different feeling. Um, because there's a, a feeling that the world is going to end because of its sinfulness or its evil. And so how we treat it doesn't really matter. It's about to end. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, so you can pollute the earth, you can do whatever you want to the earth because it's all going to just self-destruct. I, I, can't, I can't accept that, that end of the spectrum. I feel quite differently that, no, we need to do everything we can, you know, to care for, the, to be good caretakers or stewards of this beautiful earth, right, and to realize that it's all connected and how we, how we treat it. Uh, affects everything, everything. And I know that um, in my world religions class, I have my students read the Bhagavad Gita, right, which is one of your sacred texts. And, um, and it's actually become one of my favorite 
texts too. I, I, I can't even remember how many times I've, I've read it. But that idea of all nature, all creation, right, reflecting God, there's a little quote from the Gita that I am pr ever present to, to those who realize me in every creature. Seeing all life as my manifestation, they are never separate from me. Okay, isn't that beautiful? So that's the first, I think, shared value or universal value of Christianity. But then another one that's very closely connected to that is that, um, that human beings are all created in the, what in our Christian tradition, um, we say in the imago Dei, it's this Latin phrase that means in the image of God. And in the first book of the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, so Christians um, have both the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and the New Testament, the Christian scriptures, but we kind of accept the whole thing as our sacred text. And um, so in the very first book of the Bible, it speaks about, you know, when God created everything, and it speaks about, and God created the human being in God's own image and likeness. Male and female, God created them. So um, to me, how we treat other people is of utmost importance, and we should acknowledge that, what we call that imago Dei, that image of God, that divine spark, right, in everyone we encounter. Now that is very similar, really, to the real meaning, right, of namaste, about, you know, that the sacred, the holy in, in me acknowledges that in you. And um, at my street church, um, Church Beyond the Walls, uh, every Saturday before we go down to the park, we, we gather in Burnside Park, which is right next to Kennedy Plaza, and we have our worship service. And, um, and we celebrate a sacrament called Holy Communion. It has a table, and it has bread, and we use juice, um, and then then at the end of our formal worship, that table becomes like an actual table to serve a meal. And we, we have a meal together with the people who are gathered. And many of the people are living in, in poverty and, and homelessness. But before we go down to the park, we get together and we prepare the food. And the last thing we do before we head out is we say a prayer. And in our prayer, we pray that when we go to the park, we would have eyes and hearts and minds that would see Christ or God, right, in all we encounter, everyone we encounter. But also that we would reflect that light, you know, reflect God's presence to all we encounter. So that, that is our prayer. And truly, that's kind of what I pray. I, I start every morning with prayer in my home. And before I, I walk out the door, that is what I pray, that may I see God in all I encounter, and may I reflect God to all I encounter. That's a, a beautiful way to sort of start your, your day. So that idea of God in every human being. Imagine if everyone in the world, you know, um, treated everyone that way, right? Um, now, as a Christian, um, part of the, this belief for us comes from, um, so Christians have one God, but in many Christian traditions, we speak about a trinity. So it's like three gods, but really one God. Three different aspects, almost, if you will, of God. And we speak of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer. 
But, but Jesus Christ, of course, is important for Christians. But we look at Jesus as God in human form. So God made flesh. And um, in the, the New Testament, in the Gospel of John, it says, um, and the word of God, the word became flesh and lived among us, okay? Full of grace and truth. And then it says, no one has ever seen God, but it is Christ, God's son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made God known. So in, in our Christian tradition, that's called the incarnation, the miracle of the incarnation. God embodied, God made flesh. And so again, I feel like what it means, or the implications for us, right, are that if God became human, then the way we look at every human, right, needs to change. And we need to really see that, that divine nature, that divine spark in, in all people, right? So, and I know that that is something, you know, in your tradition too, that we, that we share. I think, I think most of the world's religions do have something very similar. So it is a universal um, value. Um, another universal value um, is what we call in our Christian tradition the golden rule. What is that? Do unto others as you would want others to do unto you, right? Um, it almost reminds me of like ahimsa, right? Do no harm, right? Do no harm to others. Uh, in Judaism, they say, do not do to others what you would not want done to you, right? So same idea, right? You know, however you wish to be treated, and I think we all wish to be treated with dignity, with, with respect, right, with equality, et cetera, then that is how we should treat others, no matter what, no matter what the, the circumstances, right? So, um, so that's a very universal value. And then um, another um, universal value is that this life that we're living is a journey. That life is a journey, it's a process. And I call it a spiritual journey. I really believe that ultimately it's a, it's a spiritual journey. And each of us, you know, we have a path, right? We are to, to walk and part of the journey of life is to figure out, right, what is, what is your specific life path, right? I know you have that in your tradition, we do too. And, um, and sometimes, you know, the, for all of our lives, right, there's, there's joys, there's beauties, there's blessings, there's the wonderful things of life. There's also the struggles. Every life has those struggles and those hardships and those um, difficult things, those obstacles, if you will, that challenge us on our, on our spiritual path. And so often um, I find that in every religion they speak that sometimes in our lives there's a moment of what we might call awakening, right? Or sometimes in the more conservative Christian traditions to say conversion experience uh, or an enlightenment, right? A moment when something opens, we have an epiphany, we, we realize that, you know, we've been struggling along in life, focused on things that we realize are not of ultimate importance. And we, we open to that greater dimension of life that I call, you know, the spiritual dimension of life, right? And then we begin to see that really all life 
becomes spiritual, right? And right now, in my Christian tradition, we're in this season of Lent. Have you heard of Lent? Okay. Um, and Lent is a 40-day se uh, season. And it's a season that's about repentance. And what repentance means is literally turning. It means to turn away from those things in your life that, that you know are not for your greatest good, you know? Those things that are not of God, those things that are destructive or harmful. Or, and to turn instead to those things that are, are of God, that are of the spirit, that are good, that are, you know, of light and life and health and all those things, right? And so in Lent, people sometimes focus more on spiritual practices like prayer or meditation or fasting or you know, eliminating those things from their lives that they need to, that maybe they've become too attached to, right? In order to, to open ourselves on a deeper, in a deeper way, spiritually. So this whole process of life, this journey, um, when I meet people and they find out I'm a pastor, um, they always say, well, I'd come to church, but, you know, it would probably get struck by lightning, <laughs> you know, or the roof would cave in, you know. They feel that there's something that they've done that's so, you know, terrible that there's no, you know, they could never... Uh, they could never be accepted. There could be no possibility for them. And I, I always say no, that to me, in all the great world's religions, right, there's that idea that there's nothing that is so um, bad that is that you have done that is so, uh, reprehensible that God does not have the power to turn around and transform. And I fully believe that, absolutely believe that with my whole being. I think that's why I'm a pastor, you know, because I have seen that complete turnaround in many, many people's lives, right? And when you see that, you see people completely turn their lives around. Um, I'm thinking of a, of a man from my street church who is about my age and, you know, spent half his life sleeping under bridges and had addiction issues, spent a good bit of his life in prison, you know, and today is one of the leaders of our community. You know, so when, and, and uh, just a, an amazing spiritually, you know, evolved person, you know what I'm saying? So when you see that in people's lives over and over again, right, then that's something that we can share with others who are still in that place where they're, where they're stuck and they feel like they can't, they can't get out of their own like vicious circle, right? So that idea of um, new beginnings, of possibility for, for transformation in our lives, to me that is a universal value, right, of all religions. And we approach it maybe a little differently, but that's something that we all share, right? And so in every religion, we have different spiritual practices we do sometimes to help us to continue to stay awake, be awakened, right? To continue t to be more deeply enlightened, right? To live our, our lives more fully on that spiritual path. 
and so similar to you, you know, I, I practice prayer, meditation, I practice yoga on a regular basis. Um, all these things to sort of keep myself um, on that path, on that path. Um, So really, I just have two more points, and then I'd like to open it up to some questions. I love to have input from others. So, um, but, but another universal um, value, I would say, is you know, sometimes when we use specific names, that's why I love this quote, that truth is one, but we call it by different names, you know, sometimes we say, you know, the Buddha or Jesus or Abraham, whatever we use a name, it can divide. But that idea of spirit is a more, is a more universal and uh, value, if you will. And I think a lot of young people today say, I'm not very religious, but I'm spiritual. You know, and I think, well, okay, I get that. And I think that's partly their reaction to, um, you know, there's been a lot of bad things done in the name of religion that they don't want any part of, and yet they do acknowledge that there is that deep spiritual need in all of us that they want to grow in and to develop. And in many different languages, the word for spirit is the same word for breath, for breath. So in, in Hebrew, it's ruach. And that's, in Hebrew, it's actually a she word, a feminine word. And it means wind or breath. In the Greek of the New Testament, it's P-N-E-U-M-A. Pneuma, or with the silent P, pneuma, meaning like pneumonia, right? Having to do with lungs and breath and breathing. Um, in Sanskrit, prana is the word I've learned, right? Prana. And as you know, in part of yoga practice, right, is, is breathing. And a kind of a universal meditation practice is breathing meditation. And so when I meditate with breath, I think of, you know, the spirit of life breathing in me, in every cell of my being, and then breathing out through me to bring peace, you know, joy, compassion, etc., to others. But I love that idea of spirit as breath, because it's not something that's unattainable. It's not something we have to search far and wide for. It's something as close to each of us as our very next breath. We have access to this spirit right here within us. Okay. So, and then my final universal value, if you will, um, is that God is love. And the older I get, you know, some people say, that, oh, that, you know, that sounds trite or whatever. No, nope, I'm sorry. The older I get, the more deeply I believe that, you know. In, in our Christian tradition, um, there's a beautiful little verse. It's from the book of First John. And it says, um, beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Everyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So simple, but so profound, right? And then Jesus, so of course, Christianity was like a movement within Judaism. And uh, Judaism was approximately 2,000 years old, and then, and then Jesus came along. So our whole faith is really 4,000 years old, but 
Christianity itself is 2,000 years old. And when Jesus was asked, he was a rabbi, he was asked to sum up the whole Torah, the whole Jewish faith, and he said, he gave one commandment, which is known as his greatest commandment. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor, which means everyone, as you love yourself. Jesus says, on this hangs all the Torah, the law, and the prophets. So that is Jesus' greatest commandment. And a lot of Christians think he made it up, but he didn't make it up. He was quoting two different verses from the Hebrew Bible. You know, he, was, he was being a good Jew, a good rabbi as he shared this. So, um, but I love that. And if we just lift that one commandment, things would be so different. Um, in the 1960s, and I was a kid in the 1960s, a very interesting decade to, to be <laughs> growing up, right? Um, and I was, I was deeply influenced by Dr. Martin Luther King. You know, they say your earliest childhood years are the most formative, right? So I grew up with, you know, think of that, the 60s, right? And Dr. King. Civil rights movement, women's liberation movement, you know, Vietnam War, peace movement. No, just it was quite a quite a decade. <laughs> and um, but I always think of Dr. King and his friendship with Mahatma Gandhi, right? And um, and the sharing of these two faiths, and um, how. The African Americans in this country, um, how Dr. King led them in peaceful, right, resistance. Um, and one thing that struck me, and we, I think of this a lot in today's context, today's world, is when Dr. King said, when you're confronted with hatred and you respond back, with hatred, you're only adding to the amount of hatred in the world. When you know you're right treated with hatred, and you respond with love, you are not adding to the amount of hatred. And I feel that perhaps you may actually <laughs> have tuned in to the only thing that's powerful enough to begin to dismantle that hatred. And in my Christian tradition, you know, in the New Testament, there are many words for love, not just one. Like in English, we just have one. You know, I love pizza, I love my husband, I love God. It's all like one word, and it's very different kinds of love, right? But in the Greek of the New Testament, there's several different words. And the word that's used um, is, in Jesus' teachings about love is this, there's the word agape, love, and it means God-like love, Christ-like love, um, the kind of love that sees that divine in all. And that's the love that Jesus speaks of when he says, you know, we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we are to love all others as we love ourselves. So even in the midst of this difficult context that we're living in today where there's so much hate rhetoric and, and uh, you know, difficult, I try to really say, well, instead of responding back, right, and just adding to that amount of negative and of hate in the world, to instead respond back uh, in a different way that can, I think, over time, 
transform even that. So that's a beginning. And now I, I invite questions or comments. Sir. And then you, you just mentioned about uh, people saying uh, spiritual but not religious. Do you think that uh, religious interpretation can be an obstruction to compassion? Absolutely. I really do. Who is it mentioned? This is a friend of mine, Dick. Hi, Dick. He said... Um, that he went to a Buddhist um, seminar or workshop, and they were talking about uh, obstacles to compassion. And he asked if that, um, if religious, what was your word? Interpretations. Interpretations, and that's what, I, that's what I was trying to say at the beginning. He asked if sometimes the, our religious interpretations can actually be obstructions to compassion. And that is what I was trying to acknowledge at the beginning with my own bias, because um, you know, people who call themselves Christian, as I do, will take a quote from the, a sacred text and use it to, to cause harm and to wound and to oppress and to and to me, that's an obstruction. Right? Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, John. Back there, sir. Hi. Ah, that's a really good question. Jesus Christ, he was a healer. He was a healer. He was talking with no animal. He was, you know, showing compassion to them. He was raising from the dead a dead animal. And how is it right now we have a, you know, followers of Jesus Christ who don't follow the Mm. Why do we do that? We teach people not to be compassionate, you know, and we have a place that stuck is full of meat. Mm. How do we follow the teachings of Jesus Christ? Thank you. Tell me. Okay. So in the very first book of the Bible um, is the story, the creation story of the Garden of Eden. And that it's a, it's a powerful creation story, and it's very symbolic. But it does speak about God creating all the different trees. I love that beautiful tree, and I wear the tree of life around my neck. And it speaks about, you shall eat of any of the trees of the garden. And so in a sense, people who are Vegetarians say, see, we were, it was created, the way things were created in this garden of delight in the beginning, God's intention, right, was that we do no harm and that we do eat of the fruit of the trees, eat of the plants, but not eat of the animals. And then that comes along later. And in the Christian tradition or the, the Jewish tradition even, um, it comes along, you know, we have this word sin, right, of like not, the harming. not harming, harming, right. And in fact, I feel that, you know, in the Jewish tradition, it got to the point where they would, not to be 
grotesque or anything, but you know, they would have animal sacrifices. They would kill animals as part of their, right. Right. Well, I think a lot of people are trying to do that, you know. I think there are a lot more vegetarians today and, than there were like years ago here in the U.S. Um, my, I have a daughter who's vegan, you know, so she takes that very seriously and also she feels that when you take into your body something that has been harmed painfully, you know, that you're taking that pain and that violence, if you will, into your, into your body, you know, so. It's interesting because Jesus, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm pondering whether he was in fact a vegetarian because there are a couple stories where he asks for fish and he eats fish. I'm not, I'm, it's a very interesting, you know, and I'm gonna think about that. I don't, I'm thinking of Jesus being a Jew and the Passover meal is a really important thing for Jews and that's with a lamb. And, but interestingly, so he, his last supper, Bible scholars believe, was a Passover meal. But what's interesting is that Bible scholars say that because of the sacrifice he made that he actually became, you know, we call him the Lamb of God, like he became that Lamb. So that would support what you're saying. But after he rose, there's different stories, and in a couple of them he asks his disciples to um, give him a piece of fish, and he, and he, you know, so that, that's the... See, a lot of disciples, his disciples were fishermen. Right. They, they could never eat anything else. Right. They, you know, Huge eat. fishing industry, yes. Yeah, the right. Right. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes, sir. One of the prominent uh, teachers of Sri Ramakrishna and his cohorts and other Indian uh, faith believers is that the purpose of human life is to see God. Yeah. Realize God, love God, and all the worldly pleasures are distractions from yeah. that. So, you know, the this pursuit of uh, money, sex, right. power, all of that right. is a distraction from the central purpose of uh, human life. I haven't seen that very prominently in the New Testament, but I believe. There is a mention of it somewhere about which I've had this debate with a friend who is an Episcopal priest. What is your view of what Jesus teaches? 
I, I actually very much agree with what you said. And um, one of my favorite passages that I actually have framed up in my um, office is from what is Jesus' most famous teaching. It's called his Sermon on the Mount. And, um, and that's where he says, consider the lilies of the field. You know, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet God feeds them. And he says, you know, why, you know, why do you worry about food or clothing? You know, God will take care of you. And then the final verse, which was actually my, when I was a young girl and you, there's like a, when you, cross over from childhood to adulthood. It's your confirmation. You confirm your faith. And my verse was the final verse of that passage, which is, seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness, and all other things will be yours as well. Meaning like, you know, the most important thing, right, is to see God in all things. And then to the other things, are much, much less important. So, and even the way Jesus lived, you know, he did not have wealth. Um, he lived humbly. He wandered around. He didn't even have a permanent dwelling, right? So, and I think um, Christians often don't emphasize that enough. In fact, there's a whole I think it's a miss, uh, it's a twisted version of Christianity, but some of these television preachers, you know, will say like, oh, if you believe in God and you love God, like you'll be rich and you'll, you know, and young and thin, <laughs> all these things they promise, you know, and, and no, that's not the purpose of life. Right. Thank you, sir. Chris, you had a question. Yes. Um, flying here today, I spotted a Jesus fish on a trunk of a car. Okay. A few years back, you told us a story about the Jesus fish, its origin. Can you tell us that story again? Sure. Thank you. You've seen that little fish sometimes on, and it doesn't have anything to do with food. <laughs> it doesn't, but, um, but people don't realize this, so of course, it was a big fishing culture, right? There were many of fishermen who were Jesus' followers. But in the early Christian church, when Christians were being persecuted, um, it was dangerous to be a Christian, okay? The Roman Empire would arrest you and you would be tortured and killed. So you had to, they had secret meetings, secret gatherings to even be able to worship. So if you met someone, you would draw like a half circle in the sand. And if the other person drew the other half so it looked like a simple fish, then you would know, okay, this person's also Christian. There's a, they're a safe person. We can, I can follow them and they'll lead me to a safe place where we can worship God. But the other thing is the Greek word, um, the New Testament's written in Greek, and the Greek word for fish is ichthus, and it's an acronym. And that's, this is the part most people don't know. So you, you know an acronym, for those who don't, an acronym is like SCUBA, stands for self-contained underwater breathing apparatus, right? So the first letter of each, okay? So in Greek, the word ichthus, it's a different alphabet, but in English it's like an iota, a key, a theta, an epsilon, a sigma, an iota, and an alpha, okay, the letters. But it stands for Jesu Christo, Jesus Christ, Huios, son of Theos, God, Savior. So the fish, the word fish, ichthus, the different letters are like an acronym for Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior.
Pretty nifty, isn't it? <laughs> Just a little. I forgot. I did that for a children's sermon one day. <laughs> yeah. Oh, other question, yes. Yes. But actually, Jesus Christ in his prayer is saying, Our Father who art in heaven, holy be thy name. What is his name and how shall we call him? Tell me. What is God's name and how shall we call him? Well, in the Bible, there are many, many, many names for God. Is what? Good. To, it, hallowed means to be, to make holy, to declare as holy or sacred. But I do feel that it gets tricky because of name. Words are words, you know. Words are words are not exactly what they represent. Do you know what I mean? They're they're pointing to something that's beyond them, that's bigger than they are. So. Couple you people are God's name as any name you are comfortable with and you love. For me, God's name was my dad's name. I worshiped my dad and my mom my entire life. So for me, the word God means parent. I want to honor a couple people. You've had your hand up quite a while. Thank you. And someone else had a hand up, maybe to clarify. Yes. so covered 
Yes. And that's the incarnation that we were talking about of God made flesh in Christ. Thank you. Thank you. I know our time is up. <laughs> Did you have one? No. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Reverend Forsberg, for a very thought-provoking talk on the various aspects of Christianity and how the values are universal between Vedanta and that. I'm also reminded, just to kind of close out the discussion on two aspects, um, when you talk about the name, there's also Shankara, who is the uh, philosophical version of uh, Hinduism, the, the Advaita Vedanta. and Many people say, forgive me, Lord, because I locate you in a certain place or I give a name to your unnameable aspects. So when we talk about the name of God, yes, we can pursue a different aspect. That particular name is usually given by the teacher in the form of a mantra. My understanding is probably Jesus had a similar system where his immediate disciples had slightly different teachings than the masses. And they say that, they say, I speak to the masses in parables because they hear but they do not understand. So obviously this discussion could go on for much more time, but we invite um, Reverend Forsberg again and again, and we can continue this. You also have the opportunity to continue it, of course, at Soup Supper downstairs, which you're all invited to. Um, and we will have a, a receiving line per our tradition at the end of the RT. You will stand down by that window there and people can come by. And you can take a short question or two, but we've got to be careful that an entire, entire debate doesn't, doesn't break out over in the corner there or we'll never um, finish the program tonight. Um, we have some announcements coming up. Um, next Sunday, the talk will be given by Swami Ishap Mananda from the Vedanta Society of Chicago who will be visiting. His talk is Sri Rama, the best among men. And that will be at 5 p.m. Swami Yogatmananda will be back. So the Tuesday and Friday classes will go on as usual. The current texts for Tuesday is Sri Ramakrishna and his divine play. And the Friday text is Tashvatari Upanishads. Prior to that is meditation and arati. Uh, the morning programs starting at 5.45 go on as usual, and you're invited for all of these different programs. Um, the schedule for mm -hmm. April is um, out in hard copy as well as available from the website, so you can check into that. Yeah, I'll get there, Charlie. Um, there is yoga classes on Tuesday evening at 5.30 to 6.30, um, and you can check with Roshni Darnell if you're interested in pursuing that. There is the... Um, uh, the um, retreat coming up that's in May, May 11th, that's given by Swami Atmanyana uh, Yanda of the Greater uh, Society of um, Washington, D.C. That's a full day program starting at uh, 9.30 and going to 7 p.m. Um, you can register online if you register before April 28th, you get the discounted rate of $20. Other than that, the price will go up to full um, price of $30. Um, and Sunday, April 28th, coming up, there is a fusion band concert, um, Western and Indian classical music, and that begins at 6.15 after the lecture. So with that, we'll do the closing prayer. May the divine, who is Father in heaven of the Christians, Holy One of the Jewish faith, Allah of the Muslims, Buddha of the Buddhists, Tao of the Taoists, Great Spirit of the Native Americans, Ahura Mazda of the Zoroastrians, and Brahman of the Hindus, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May the all-loving being manifest unto us and grant us abiding and understanding and all-consuming divine love. Peace, peace. Peace be unto all.